Welcome, my name is John Farmer. I'm a law professor at Rutgers University, and I'm here today with Joshua M. Green, whose book, Justice at Dachau, tells the story of the largest, yet perhaps least known, war crimes trials in history. The Dachau trials were overshadowed in their time by the much more prestigious Nuremberg trials taking place 65 miles to the north. But it was at Dachau that men and women who actually ran the operation of Hitler's concentration camps were brought to justice. The chief prosecutor at Dachau was Colonel William Denson, a 32-year-old law professor from Birmingham, Alabama. The year after his death in 1998, Denson's widow approached Joshua with an astonishing cache of material her husband had been compiling for more than 50 years. This extraordinary archive formed the basis of Mr. Green's book, released this past year in paperback by the American Bar Association. Joshua, welcome. Let me ask you, why in your estimation have so few people heard of the Dachau trials? Well, the American way is to play up our successes, not our failures. And uh, the Dachau trials showed how easy it is to betray due process for political reasons. Let me tell you the story briefly. By 1945, November, the Nuremberg trials are going on, and that's the prosecution and the parent trial of 22 men who were the chieftains, the policymakers of the Nazi party. Where were all the other Nazis? There were more than a quarter of a million automatic arrestees in the American zone of liberation. About 60,000 of those were held over for trial on the grounds of former concentration camp Dachau. The others were denazified, basically made to fill out a questionnaire and sent on their merry way. At Dachau is where the U.S. government held their commissions. We call them tribunals today. So there's so many really riveting moments in your book, but is there, was there one um, outstanding moment um, in the course of your research really stood out to you as, as uh, signifying the importance of his work? In the um, Mauthausen trial, Mauthausen distinguished itself by its quarry, the Wiener Graben uh, prisoners emaciated, uh, undernourished, sick, should not have been allowed to work at all, were made to chisel 100-pound stones from the size of the quarry and carry them up uh, what were known as the steps of death. If any of them made it up without falling, the SS had this game they would play. They'd use a birch tree as a slingshot. They would tie prisoners to the tree and uh, hurl them to their death on the rocks below. Uh, in the Dachau trial, the first parent trial, you have um, Klaus Schilling, who was the recipient of two Rockefeller grants for medical research, uh, so world-renowned, who simply could not resist the temptation offered to him by Himmler to set up his laboratory inside the grounds of Camp Dachau, where he gave Schilling two dozen or so human guinea pigs every week and he would infect them with Anopheles mosquitoes and then overdose them to try to find a cure and hundreds died in this way. Denson could not believe what his eyes saw. Uh, in so fact, his first reaction was disbelief. Total disbelief. Yeah. It, it, he said, my worst enemy going into these trials was my own inability to accept that human beings are capable of the depth and scale of horror that I saw. There is footage of uh, Bill Denson in the courtroom mm. at Dachau in 1946-47. By the end of the third parent trial, which was uh, Flossenburg, his body weight had dropped from 168 pounds to 116 pounds. The constant exposure day after day after day to the evidence of these atrocities the depth and scale of which nothing in his God-fearing southern young man's mind could possibly sum up uh, had, was taking its toll, and he collapsed in court. Most of those convicted in the work of uh, Colonel William Denson in the initial year were hanged. As time went by, U.S. priorities shifted. By 1947, when uh, uh, Russia achieved its first nuclear chain reaction. The enemy was no longer Nazi Germany, and U.S. priorities were not punishing Germans, but winning Germany's allegiance in a united front against the new common enemy, namely Stalin's Red Army, knocking over country after country, sweeping, sweeping west. So in a series of 
clandestine, and I want to underline that, there was clandestine uh, changes in uh, uh, verdicts. The U.S. government, as, a, as an olive branch to the new German Republic, released all of the imprisoned Nazi war criminals, almost 2,000 men and women, responsible for the worst crimes in history. It was not our finest hour. What was, what was um, Colonel Jensen's reaction? How did that affect him when he learned that the, the sentences were being uh, commuted and the people were being released? He did not want this to be political expediency. He didn't want history looking back and saying this was a farce, this was just victor's justice. He wanted real due process convictions and he got them. Unfortunately, politics at the time worked against him. Bill Denson, after the trials ended, went home. He did not know until he read about it in the newspapers mm. that the U.S. government had decided to essentially throw out two years of his heartfelt work winning due process convictions against Hitler's henchmen. And uh, for him, it was the worst betrayal of justice imaginable. I was particularly captivated by your descriptions of the defense counsel because they, they were, for the most part, American army officers in the JAG Corps who were assigned to represent uh, Nazis, the people they had been fighting months earlier. So you have Douglas T. Bates, who was Bill Denson's counterpart, the chief defense lawyer, walking the boards with his team day after day prior to accepting asking themselves, what's this going to do to our family? What's going to happen when we go back home? And people find out that we were the ones who defended the operators of Hitler's concentration camps. They came to the decision that as, as men of the law, they had a responsibility to defend not hardened criminals, not torturers and murderers, but this, the process of law. And uh, they did a damn fine job. I mean, if you read their arguments, and then there's 12,000 pages of, of, of trial transcripts, it's, it's awfully impressive um, how diligently they went about their work. The, the, the prosecution brought a charge of common design against the accused, which means not a specific criminal action, but a pattern of behavior that the accused did knowingly participate in operating these camps which were geared toward the starvation, the torture, the humiliation, and ultimately the murder of prisoners. And by voluntarily staying in these camps, they were guilty of the crimes in the camp itself. Defense took the position that, now wait a minute, what is this common design? Where is this common design? An accused is entitled to know what he's accused of, where it's supposed to have happened, how it was supposed to have happened. Did they suffer any repercussions as a result of being that tenacious in their defense uh, of the Nazis? When they went back home, they were branded Nazi lovers. Hmm. Doug Bates uh, wanted to run for public office. I've seen his office. It's this little three-story wooden building in Centerville, Tennessee, population two and a half. <laughs> Uh, this lovely little place where he had a law practice prior to the war. When he be went back, uh, he, he lost his practice for the most part, and people did, he wanted to run for public office. He was denied doing that because of what he had done at Dachau, and, uh, and that's, uh, that's unfair, and that should never have been allowed to happen. He is a shining example of the very thing we were fighting for. We were fighting for the right rule of law, <laughs> due process, <laughs> <laughs> to give people due process and rule of law. So uh, he should be uh, credited for that, not punished. Have the Dachau trials had an impact on on proceedings today? Um, and is there something in these trials that you think uh, would be illuminating and useful for lawyers whose practice is outside the the specific arena of war crimes? In the Dachau trials, the chief prosecutor, Bill Denson established precedents that are used today in the International Criminal Court and elsewhere, particularly with regard to uh, chain of command. How far down the line can you hold people responsible? Yeah. There's another impact, however, uh, that is, I believe, uh, equally important, namely to remind men and women in the field of law 
uh, that they have one of the most important jobs on earth. Uh, when I meet people at uh, state bar associations and elsewhere, they, they often confide a disappointment that when they think about how much time and money they've spent getting where they are, that the rewards are not as uh, great as they thought they were going to be. They f there's burnout. Um, they wonder if they made the right career choices for themselves. A few have told me they would never recommend to their children that they pursue a career in law. So uh, if someone needs a reminder uh, of the importance of a career in law and what can happen when lawyers and judges, law professors, um, do not invest themselves in due process of law, um, just visit the sites of the atrocities. Go to the camps. Right? Um, when Hitler's policies received the endorsement of the legal establishment of Germany, that's when the success of the Nazi party was guaranteed. So my recommendation for uh, people feeling burnout in their law career, go on the March of the Living. You know, it's a good reminder of how vital a career in law really is. This is a particularly challenging time uh, for Holocaust awareness. Uh, as a Holocaust educator, do you find the Dachau trials important for safeguarding the memory of the Holocaust, and if so, in what ways? The educational community, the legal community, play a critical role in Holocaust memory because they both deal with that tricky terrain between history as it really was and history as we might like it to have been. All right. um, and that's, that's the dilemma we face in Holocaust history today, the search for truth at a time when, when truth itself is being described as fake. On a daily basis. Yeah. On a daily basis. It's a time when um, party politics would erase history in order to bolster a national image or to serve some artistic end. Um, so honest confrontation with memory, not narrow um, political agendas, is where truth and justice lie. Well, Joshua, thank you for sitting down with us today. I, I, I think I mentioned to you off camera that I had gone on the March of the Living uh, last year for the first time, and I found uh, it to have made the experiments at once more real uh, and at the same time more mystifying. And your book and its riveting descriptions of the conduct that occurred uh, and of the, the attempts of the lawyers on both sides to try to seek some form of justice uh, just reinforces those conclusions. And, and I really want to thank you for your time today. Well, uh, you're very welcome. It's been my pleasure.